Network. On the horn. <laughs> On the horn .com. You are listening. Wow, this doesn't sound right. <laughs> You're listening to News Talk tonight on The Horn. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and just about any other electronic aspect. And that's fascinating. Okay, let's try that. Okay. Apparently we have to play with the settings to a certain degree, and I seem to be pinning out. I'm Dave Moore. You're listening to OnTheHorn.com, and with us tonight, we have Jen Just. Hi. Yay! Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. I'm going to turn down the internets then. Excellent. Yes, that's better. <laughs> and also sitting in the studio, uh, mining the store with me, is Brian Lee. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well... News talk tonight, we usually focus on Connecticut, particularly Connecticut politics, because uh, that's been the more scintillating aspect of news in Connecticut. And, well, to us anyway. Well, yeah, and <laughs> to me in particular. So uh, hopefully we won't bore people to tears talking about conventions, both past and present as well as uh, the various races that are happening that are suddenly becoming not only a, of local interest, but also of national interest. Yes. Uh, that would be the senatorial campaign and also the 5th District campaign. Um, and one of the things that I noticed on the news today that I'm just going to do a, a brief mention is Connecticut is one of five states that are actually now ready for, lack of a better descriptor, Obamacare. Hmm. Uh, apparently, we we have got everything in place in order to plug into both on a state level as well as a local level the Health Care Reform Act, which I thought was interesting because three of the states – that are opting out are the states that need it the most. Texas being one of them. Yes. And uh, it's it's fascinating to see how Tip O'Neill's comment about how all politics is local mm. is kind of sort of playing out, not necessarily the way that he intended when he made <laughs> that comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as the 5th District is concerned, um, a voice from the a blast from the past. A governor who has been silent for two years has suddenly broken her silence and is now endorsing the Republican uh, nominee. Apparently, Governor Rell came out today specifically in public to endorse Senator Rohrabach for the 5th wow. District. And uh, she basically was saying, look, you know, the other side, meaning Elizabeth Esty and her campaign, have basically been painting Rohrabach as uh, not so much anti-woman, but supporting a party that is anti-woman. And so the governor felt that it was incumbent upon her, no pun intended, <laughs> to uh, actually come out and say that as a woman and as a politician who has dealt with women's issues on a state level, she believed that Rohrabach would be the candidate to support. Um, it's interesting, though. I wonder, did, I mean, it's always one of those things like, did she actually make that decision or did the state party go to her or did even the national people say you need to get somebody do you know what I mean? I'm always interested in how those decisions, quote unquote, actually happen. I or even the timing. Right. I, I, and I personally believe all of the above. I think yeah. that the National Party reached out to Jody and said, you got to step in. Uh, know that you've wanted to be in retirement, but uh, this is something that we could actually get some traction on, and you need to uh, 
come out and say something. And right. you need to do it soon. And then they reached out to Rohrbeck's um, campaign and said, you know what? We've reached out to Jody. Now you need to reach out to her. And you got to ha- have it happen now. And as the political stars aligned, it occurred now. <laughs> Interesting stuff there. The SD campaign, of course, is saying, well, we're not saying that Senator Rohrbeck is like uh, Romney or his running mate or Senator Aiken. We're just saying that he would have to support the agenda of the National Party, which is decidedly anti-woman. Uh, Rell's comments basically tried to refute that to a certain degree. Uh, nonetheless, the first question, you know, Rohrbeck in his commentary basically said, I am my own person. You cannot paint me as uh, one way or the other other than what I have said and other than what my record speaks to. The problem is... Good luck working with the Republican Congress. (laughs) Exactly. The problem is if and when the new Congress comes into session and the Republicans still have more seats than the Democrats, then the very first vote is going to be who's going to be Speaker. And you know that Senator Rohrabach is not going to vote for a Democrat. It's pretty plain and simple. And that's the point that the SD campaign is attempting to make, I think, reasonably uh, correctly, I think, reasonably forcefully. Nonetheless, uh, you do have, uh, let's put it this way, Governor Rell said that we are now entering the political silly season, (laughs) where uh, campaigns will say just about anything in order to get their points across. Uh, we're certainly seeing that in the senatorial campaign, but it's been a bit more restrained in the 5th District. Uh, Esty is now dealing with the fact that she is the only person running on the Democratic ledger and also the Working Families ledger. Yes, that's Because a the uh, soon-to-be former Speaker of the House of the State Repre- uh, House of Representatives has now formally backed out, uh, that being Donovan. And he, in fact, did uh, this last week formally endorse Esty yeah. once the Working Families Party's change occurred. That wouldn't have occurred had he not been willing to step out. So kudos to the Speaker for realizing the political realities and realizing that he was going to hurt uh, the Democratic and Working Family Party's position if he was to stay in. True. Yeah. Uh, then you began to see both Rohrerback and SD starting to try to paint the picture for the other side and paint them hopefully in a corner. That hasn't really gained traction as far as the Rohrerback attempts are concerned. And I can't say that it, the same that there's been a whole lot of success as far as Esty is concerned versus Rohrerback because Senator Rohrerback's record is actually pretty moderate when all is said and done. When well, you... I think, yeah, I mean, whatever her efforts, though, the, the, the picture of the Republican Party nationally right now, I just think makes his job difficult to make a case that he can do anything as a moderate Republican. I mean, he may be a Connecticut Republican, and, you know, we all, you know, actually like some (laughs) Democrat, uh, Connecticut Republicans. But the fact is that a moderate Republican can't get anything done in in the Republican Party anymore. So I'm not sure that his, even his own argument, it makes a case for himself, if you know what I mean. Do you think that uh, Romney's choice of, of, uh, Representative Ryan as his um, running mate hurt Rohrerback? Yes, absolutely. I think it hurts Romney, frankly. I mean, I think you've got, you know, Romney basically running a, I mean, he, here's Ryan's budget that everyone's sort of backing away from. 
Um, Romney's trying to hew back a little bit. To, I wouldn't call it towards the middle, but less, less, way over on the fringe right. Um, and that's tough to do when you've got Paul Ryan as your running mate. So, you know, they have, I mean, and you just, just looking at the convention last week, I mean, this is a party of radicals at this point, or certainly it's being run by radicals. Um, and I don't see how Rohrbach, I mean, I just don't see him fitting in that group, and I don't see how he could get anything done. The, so, the the other thing is we, we, we're also dealing with um, a national party that has now formally put as its plank, we have to do away with abortion. Yes. Has put yeah. in yet another plank about how there needs to be an amendment to the Constitution supporting life. Well, this is where the Democrats' message early on about the Republicans' war on w women was brilliant because it's such a simple uh, concept. <laughs> you just see it in in the platform. I mean, it, it is unconscionable that they're talking about making this a constitutional amendment. I mean, this isn't even about, you know, whether or not federal, you know, there's going to be federal money paid for this. This is actual, like, you know, reversing Roe versus Wade. It's just unbelievable to me, not to mention to sort of all the other issues around women and women's health that have come up over the course of this. Frankly, it seemed like a silly season from the beginning almost at this point. It's just been, you know, if you had had to look back at the litany of things that have been said over this, you know, past year, it's just sort of boggles the mind. And then there's uh, the Missouri senator, uh, I'm sorry, the Missouri Republican nominee, nominee for the yeah. Senate, uh, Representative Aiken, who makes these ludicrous comments. And it's then pointed out that Ryan was supporting almost 80% of Aiken's legislation yeah, yeah. that was decidedly not in favor of women's right to choose or anything else that would be near and dear to the uh, Republicans, and I haven't really seen a whole lot of walking back on Ryan's part relative to uh, his former support for Aiken's positions, which were frankly his positions. Yep. And you don't hear, to bring it back locally, Senator Rohrabach decrying with any real emphasis or um, force. Well, this is where comments. his challenge is because for him to to compl I mean, to, for him to 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 push back against that would sit well with, you know, the his constituents in the fifth CD, but not with the national party, you know. And so I, I don't know. I just find he's in a very interesting conundrum right now. I just don't. I I, I just I think it's kind of interesting. Um, meanwhile, Elizabeth, I just would love to see. Um, a little bit more. I mean, to have another female congresswoman in Connecticut would be amazing as well. Um, and I mean, I don't know if they really want to be. <laughs> it's pretty obvious that she would be if she was elected. But um, to talk about really supporting women's issues, I'd love to see her come out with something very specific about that. Emily's List has supported uh, Elizabeth Estes' campaign, uh, but not to the extent that some people would think. Uh, the Report came out last week that Emily's List has pumped in about twenty-three thousand dollars to the SD campaign, which is not as significant an amount as one would think for a a pack that is basically supporting women's issues. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that what you're going to see in the end run is more support on the ground from supporters of Emily's List, then you are going to see money coming in. Right, right, right. What is also interesting is that in the last three weeks, Esty has raised three times the money that Rohrabach has, and this mm. is after the primaries. Uh, Esty was reported to have raised about 750000 and Rohrabach about 250000 mm. Ouch. Hmm. And... This is a district that both major parties are seeing as uh, something to pump money into. 
And that really hasn't happened yet. Yeah. And I'm wondering what they're waiting for. <laughs> I know. There's a lot. I mean, I don't know whether, yeah, I've been sort of curious, too, about it. It just seems like we're late in the season for a bunch of things. For one thing, I don't know, we don't have to switch the subject right away, but I'm sort of dying to see the, the videos of Linda McMahon's WWE exploits come out. I just feel like Murphy hasn't hit back hard enough against her yet. But um, but going back a little bit to what you were saying also, I've been wondering too, I don't know if, if anyone has done a count yet of how much outside money has come into the state yet or how much PAC support there is behind our candidates. Be curious to see how those numbers, because I know that's been a huge concern, um, certainly on the Democratic side, <clears throat> on the other. So start curious to see well, as, how those numbers end up being. As I pointed out, Emily's list has only plopped in twenty three thousand. Yeah. Uh, now there are certain people that the SD family has reached out to that have contributed, but it's from my understanding less than six figures which means that Esty has drawn a fair amount of support from Connecticut residents, more so than the Rohrbach campaign is comfortable with. Right. And Rohrbach is very quick to point out that pretty much all of the 250000 that he's raised has come from Connecticut residents. That's fine, well, and good. The problem is $250,000 does not a congressional seat win you. It does not. And uh, the other campaign that is sounding the uh, financial panic button is the Chris Murphy campaign. Yeah. Um, There was a report that came out on Connecticut News Junkie that is actually a New Haven independent story by Melissa uh, Bailey, who uh, noted that Chris Murphy is their yesterday today and tomorrow and then he comes back to connecticut why well in part because the mcmahon uh campaign was saying well linda mcmahon is talking to all the connecticut voters right now what's chris murphy doing he's pavaleering and having a great time down in north carolina i would think even before she said that though yeah i mean why would he spend a lot of time there because I mean, he's he raising be. money. <laughs> well, that's what. But was interesting, David, is that he he's not doing a big. I read the same piece. As far as I could see, they're not doing a huge fundraiser there, which kind of surprised me. No, but he is doing a lot of handshaking, meet yeah. and greet, with people who are potentially going to become big donors in the relative near future. Well, I hope so. Um, <laughs> because. He wasn't just talking to folks who are from the Connecticut delegation. The Connecticut right. delegation has about 88 people, most of them politicians. Uh, the people that he was reaching out to were the folks that have deeper pockets. Right. And that was something that he needs to do, that he needed to do. Uh, that was something that most assuredly Chris Dodd was telling him he should do. <laughs> um, of course, Former Senator Dodd has no real comment for the press or for public cons- consumption because he's now the president of the movie organization but mm-hmm. and, and, and is not in politics or so he claims anymore. <laughs> That's the not case. Not partisan politics anyway. That's the case. Why are you at the convention, Senator? But anyways. <laughs> the, uh, the he was reason... both, though. Wasn't he at the Republican convention also that's a good question i did not see anything about that i think he was i think i saw somewhere else that he he attended a it would make sense yeah given his position now to be at both because he wants to get garner support from deep pockets on both sides not for any political reasons but to support the the arts industry right yeah um but the reason why this is a pertinent discussion is that uh, it appears as though um, Chris Murphy has raised about three million dollars whereas Linda McMahon has raised about 12. Yes. Now a lot of that money has come from Linda herself. In fact one could argue most of it. But there's going to be a point in time when you're going to see the super PACs drawing aim for Connecticut. And 
I don't know if I can withstand that. Well, I mean, the interesting thing, I wouldn't be so concerned normally because, for example, I mean, Blumenthal was way out spanning two years ago, right. except for that Chris Murphy doesn't have the name recognition that Blumenthal did. And he still has a ways to go there, and I'm very concerned about that. And I'm hoping to come out with a slew of TV ads that, you know, introduce him more to people because it's it's a little scary that that's still an issue for him. It appears as though he his campaign, not he himself, but that his campaign is focusing more on responding to McMahon than it is really trying to define their candidate. Yeah. And that's always a problem. Uh, and it causes both campaigns to descend into negativity to a, to a degree that will turn off a lot of voters. Especially this early in the campaign. You start going negative this early or within the next two weeks, it's way too soon. It's well, and it's interesting because I got an email today from the campaign, and it was all negative about Linda, and I'm thinking, you don't have to preach to me. Like, I'm already on your email list. You right. know, I already get who Linda is. What you need to do is be finding people who don't know who you are and tell tell them who you are. Like, I don't need to hear negative. You, you've sold me. I'm on your email list. You've sold me. You know, why am I getting this? There, so. was, there was a reason why the Blumenthal campaign held off on two particular ads that are, are still etched in my mind. <laughs> and those are the WWE ads. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The one where she's climbing the ropes and the other where she, and throwing the chair. And the other is where she's kneeing the guy in the groin. Uh, that tells you, I mean, those ads were run two years ago. I still remember them. Yeah. That says something, but they weren't rolled out until two weeks before the election. Yep. That's all he needed to do. Yep. And, you know, she was already dealing with fairly significant negative numbers in that campaign. That pretty much put her over the edge, put him over the edge. That's why he won by over 100,000 votes. Mm -hmm. the, the, the folks on the Murphy campaign are, they, they need to run those ads, but not on top of the ones that they're running right now. Right. And I would tend to agree with you, Jen, that having, for instance, the ad where Chris was shopping with his family and he ends up talking to a whole bunch of people. Right. That was a good ad to help define who Chris Murphy is. Yep. Because it got some of the points that he supports out and it also showed him as a family man. And, you know, he's got two cute kids. Who's going to say cute kids <laughs> are bad? Mm -hmm. Okay. They, they've gotten away from that and they need to get back to it. Yeah. in order for them to have a campaign that is going to effectively deal with $12 million. Right. Because, uh, as I said before, when the super PACs finally zone in on us, and by us I mean the state of Connecticut, you're going to see ads that are really over the top, <laughs> negative-wise. And oh, it's gosh. not really going to help either campaigns as it stands right now. And as you were pointing out, Jen, I saw that <clears throat> there is roughly 20% uh, of the voters out there who still don't know who Chris Murphy is. They know he's the endorsed Democratic candidate, but they don't know him. Yeah. And a lot of that is either in Fairfield County or east of the river. And there isn't anything that the campaign has been noticeably ginning up to deal with that. Everybody in the third, the first, and the fifth, because they are contiguous uh, seats, districts, if you will, has a pretty good idea of who Chris Murphy is because they've seen his ads. Right. For when he was running for the fifth. Folks in the fourth and folks in the second have never seen his ads before until the primary. Right. And 
geez louise something ought to be done as far as that's concerned and the same thing could be said for mcmahon as far as yeah she has better name recognition because she ran against blumenthal but we still haven't heard what she's really in favor of or specific policy points and it would be good to see that coming out in her ads so that she can better define herself without being redefined by the Murphy campaign. Hint, hint, Murphy campaign. Hint, hint. <laughs> yeah, I gather she's very much not interested in being specific about her policy points. She's also very interested in not being interviewed. Yes. What is she on, like, her third or fourth um, press person? Yes. The third having resigned two weeks ago. I think I, I wrote a poem a couple of weeks ago. I think they, they, they left because they didn't have anything to do. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, un, to, to shift topics yet again, although slightly related, um, we have a Democratic convention that is taking place down in North Carolina. Yes. And our esteemed governor will be speaking tomorrow night, 6 p.m., granted, not prime time, but prime minus one, maybe? <laughs> At what time? 6 well, p.m. He, that doesn't he, even get you on the telecast. No, but it does get you on potentially the 6.30 national news, depending yeah. on how long he speaks. Uh, he has <laughs> promised that he will not speak to a chair. <laughs> Why? Oh, well. Well, <laughs> he doesn't have the di directorial sense that perhaps <laughs> Clanice would have. Thank God. Um, he said that he might bring a chair with him, <laughs> <laughs> but that he would not talk to it. You guys have a question from the chat room? Yes. Uh, Jimmy Carter is doing a taped promo for the Obama convention. Do you feel this helps or hurts? Discuss amongst yourselves. <laughs> I believe it was Linda Richmond who said that. However, discuss amongst yourselves. So, what Andy, do you think, Jen? Do you think that Jimmy Carter um, helps or hurts? God, I don't know if anyone re remember who he is. So, depending on what he says, it could help. Um, so honestly, he's just some kooky old eighty-eight-year-old dude. <laughs> exactly, you know, with a southern accent, so that could play to the folks. And uh, I will I not know. talk to a chair. <laughs> I will not talk to a chair uh, rosin what, what are you doing i don't think it can hurt i mean you know i don't think it can hurt necessarily i mean the person i'm really excited to see and also because i've been told that he also is not getting his script or whatever vetted is bill clinton oh no that, that could they be are, interesting they, they have they have they are not going to see what he's going to say i can't believe that's true but that's what i read that's the, tomorrow correct that is tomorrow which is amazing yeah. that that's going to happen at the same time as the NFL game. Oops. Yeah. Oh. That could be a problem. Yeah. So um, sadly, most of the country will be turned in to, or tuned into that. Not at six o'clock. They'll be tuned into local news. Then. Well, if the president, <laughs> I mean, when when is Clinton? He's he's clearly a a keynote guy. So right. he's going in the power hour, is my guess. He's got to be at least ten o'clock. That's first half. Yeah. And you also have Elizabeth Warren, who is tagged as the keynote speaker. Okay. And she is going in at 9. Yeah. <laughs> that's kickoff. <laughs> good luck. That's not good. And she's keynote. I thought it was Julian Castro or whatever his name was. There was some... <clears throat> I... You may be right. Uh, I, I was seeing some stuff that indicated that Warren was to be the keynote speaker which would help her campaign up in Massachusetts, but I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's two keynotes. Well, it does say, Antonio, see, I get to, now because I'm not there, I'm actually going on the internet to meet keynote speaker Julian Castro. Okay. But I mean, what she says will be hugely important. I mean, she's such a great speaker too. I mean, that's what I, I love about the, I, the, one of the few things I love about the conventions is, is seeing does someone break out? You know, is there someone who gives a speech like Barack Obama did um, where you say, wow, that person is going to 
and I mean Elizabeth Warren, we've already seen has the ability to, you know, to do that. I wonder, you know, if giving a nationwide speech like that, is she going to come across the same way she has in videos and stuff like that? To answer the chat room's question, I don't think that uh, Jimmy Carter giving a videotaped uh, endorsement of President Obama is going to really do much for the campaign. I don't think it's going to hurt the campaign. Uh, but the Republicans will be very quick to point out that Jimmy Carter was a one-term president and that his successor was one of the greatest presidents of the United States. That's what the <laughs> Republicans will say. That's not what I'm saying. Well, I'd be interested say, to see. I, I don't know what that, he's oh. supposed to say. So that I'm, I'm interested that because that, he has not been asked to speak at conventions. For that very reason. Yeah. Pretty much. Just because so, he was one term? Yeah, and because he presided over one of the worst economies right. that we had had in quite some time. It didn't help that the economy really presaged, uh, I mean, the, the economy really started going downhill long before he became president of the United States. But he proved how political verite, we are in a malaise, didn't really work well with the American voter. It yeah. just didn't. Be just because it was kind of sort of true, didn't matter and uh, i think one of the things that carter was able to do was to refashion himself afterwards as being a peacemaker and he had a certain international cachet that worked well for him post presidency and in that regard he would be seen as a decent boost he would also be likely to fire up the the real core Democrats as well. And in that sense, that would be good for the Obama campaign. But for the independent voter, for the Republican voter who is not turned on by the national Republican stuff, Carter is not going to really reach them. Yeah, I don't see him having much of a bounce from any other. Now my, but I am curious to see what he's going to say. My, my question to Brian and to Jen is we have our governor speaking tomorrow at 6 p.m. Yes. Is this a sign that he is sticking a toe into national politics? Yes. I would say yes. <laughs> absolutely. And That's if not so, even a sign. Yeah, he absolutely. is. And if so... How and when? You know, the one of the things that strikes me is that um, there are certain members of the cabinet who have been getting their fair share of uh, Republican shellacking. And who are probably pretty darn tired of it. One of whom is Eric Holder. And... Now, whether or not the Fast and Furious stuff sticks or not, whether or not uh, Congress is actually going to try to hold him in contempt or not, uh, is, I mean, all that's interesting stuff, but frankly, he really hasn't gotten a whole lot of support from either the Senate or even the White House as far as any pushback relative to the House of Representatives is concerned. And I'm wondering whether or not a former prosecutor, now governor, might be positioning himself to be the next AG. And I'm not even suggesting that Malloy would be um, stepping down as governor you know, as of January, I, I don't think that that's going to be the case, but it could be the case in two years. And I'm wondering if that actually has any sense of truth to either of my compatriots on the air right now. I think that's interesting, especially given what Malloy's 
prospects look right now for 2014 here? <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying they look horrible, but I mean, he has not endeared himself, as we all know. His pool numbers are horrible. And if Barack gets a second term, I mean, it's. I think it's an interesting idea, actually. Well, the um, other thing too is that if if he is positioning himself for a nas- for some national spotlighting, if you will, uh, the AG's office would be a wonderful place to launch a campaign from in the future. Is it how many uh, attorney general have run for office? Bobby Kennedy. Ah, oh, yes. And he would have been the Democratic nominee had he not been assassinated in Los Angeles. Yes. So, uh, and he probably would have won, given the uh, positioning that he had, and also the fact that he had very strong Democratic support, and there were plenty of independents who were really pleased with what he had done with the mob, what he had done with uh, the uh, voting rights, uh, with racial issues uh he had broad support until he was shot what well, is interesting you know that position i mean obviously dick blumenthal was an attorney general if you're looking at sort of and um and um andrew cuomo who had a disastrous first run for governor went on to be attorney general and to you know that gave him a very successful and and also because of exactly these other policies that he was you know, promoting and fighting for, and he's ended up being a really good governor. You know, it's it's interesting that that was exactly the right move for him to take in order to, to reach a higher office. Of course, if you um, actually have listened to Andrew Cuomo speak, you realize that the apple did fall kind of sort of far from the tree. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Not one of your most uh, exciting extemporaneous speakers. But a decent governor, I gather. I guess you don't have to. New Yorkers have not tossed him out just yet. <laughs> um, but, th- yeah, no, it's an interesting idea. The, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, ever since that series that Ted Mann ran, I've wondered if um, Malloy was interested in a, in a high, or his people around him were interested in a higher office. It just seemed like they were, he was positioning even then, or at least there was something in those reports that suggests that he you know, had a sort of grander vision than little old Connecticut. We're going to pay some bills, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about, I don't know, Jen, if you had a chance to read a certain op-ed at ctnewsjunkie.com by Heath Fail. I did not, but I'll do it while you're paying the bills. Um, (laughs) How Mitt Romney can win Connecticut. Oh, interesting. All right. I'm going to check it out right now. So we will be... uh, Right back after uh, paying some bills. Click, load, listen on the horn. On the horn dot com. We could have had a we we could have had actual DJs. You'll get a kick out of this one. Instead, uh, we got these guys. Forty-seven percent of people on the radio don't wear pants. It's a fact. It's a work in progress. On the horn.com. On the horn.com. Bud Woods and Meyer Jack PC is a large Connecticut based CPA firm with offices in Cheshire and Farmington, Connecticut. Large enough to handle engagements of enterprises with annual revenues in excess of $100 million, yet small enough to cater to smaller businesses and individual clients who expect personalized attention from partners and staff. Client service is the cornerstone of our practice. Our clients have a fixed fee for their audit and tax work. What this means to the client is we're approachable. Personal communication and client services make for strong relationships. Bud Woods and Meyer Jack, certified public accountants. Sandit's Travel for business and leisure. We'll take you there. Sandit's Travel has been proudly serving Connecticut since 1960. That's over 50 years. And we're ready for another 50 years of superior service. Whether you prefer to come in, call in, or log on, we invite you to explore how efficient, diverse, and fun it is to book through Sandit's Travel. Save your money and your time with us. Sandit's Travel. We'll take you there. Fresh, organic, and homegrown. On the horn. On the horn.com. And we're back. Well, the fun thing is, 
you when you do op eds is you can push the limits of reality. <laughs> The yes. problem with this particular scenario that was presented by Heath Bale in ctnewsjunkie.com is that um, what he says actually can have some traction, but a number of assumptions have to be made. And, of course, you know what happens when you assume things. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> now... Uh, Heath uh, is a respected writer, and I think that uh, he is an incredibly intelligent person, and he is also very conservative. I like Heath. I think that uh, what he wrote was not fluff. What he wrote was not cotton candy. But I cannot necessarily agree with the assumptions that he makes in order to overcome what the polls have pointed out is a seven-point differential of all yeah. likely voters. And the, if anything, this op-ed should be used to spur the Democratic Party into a little more activity so that there is not a level of complacency that uh, might well exist at this point in time as far as the presidential election is concerned. Because it is clear that even a swing of eight or seven uh, electoral votes could actually make the difference in this particular election. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I was looking at the map, and I mean, yeah, and he does say it's difficult but doable. I mean, I think the emphasis oh. should be on difficult, if not almost impossible. There but are I think plenty of caveats saying, you know, in there. Uh, what? There are plenty of caveats in there. I, I yeah. will grant you that. But when you talk about complacency also, I mean, I think back to 2008 and when I was working on the Obama campaign, it's not even just complacency. It's, I mean, for example, I mean, I'm trying to to um, to volunteer on the campaign, but I don't have a lot of time to do it. And I don't, I mean, I felt such a sense of urgency four years ago that I just put everything aside to work on it. And this year, I just can't. I mean, and there, I still feel, I mean, I, I feel as if I should have a sense of urgency, but it's just not the same. And I have a job. I mean, I didn't have a job four years ago, so it did make it a little bit easier. But, you know, I would think that I would be spending every night out there in phone banks, and I'm just not doing it. And um, I don't mean to – I just think that when I look at other people that volunteered, um, it's just very, very hard to get the enthusiasm that's necessary to spend those hours after work making the calls and, and doing the kind of work that needs to get done. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Democratic Party has a big job sort of getting people out to do this footwork um, motivation. when they get back. Motivation. Yeah. Now, Real motivation. Brian, having skimmed. Mm. There's, a, there's a lot of numbers on that. There are a That's lot of numbers. silly. I, I'm like, come on, I can't even do the math that quick. I just looked at the math <laughs> in the different colors. And I'm like, I'm looking at Brantford as light red. Really, I don't think so. I, I don't know if you can see this, Jen. It's all gray. <laughs> oh really? I don't have a oh, color. I, I, I wish have, I could I have post Dave's it copy for you guys. It's all, it's all gray just, is not helpful. No. It's light gray or dark no. gray? <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm seeing then. Okay. <laughs> I am seeing in Heath's map that Brantford is light pink. Guilford is is even a little bit for Romney, which is crazy. Um, North Haven is dark red, which I can sort of see. Woodbridge is for Romney? No. Um, Bethany, I guess maybe I could see. Milford? No, Mil there, if Milford is also red, which makes no sense. Yeah. So. Well, the, the other thing, too, is he's assuming that uh, the Republicans are so energized yeah. that – 85% of registered Republicans are going to show up and they're going to uniformly vote for Romney. Right. 
He's also assuming that they could garner 65% of the independent vote. And I, I haven't seen anything that would justify that assumption. And it's also okay. assuming that 75% of the independents get out to vote. Well, That's here's insane. again where I get back to my question of the Republicans having this muddled message with Romney and Ryan on the same ticket. Like, which party do you want? And so how can you be really enthusiastic when you have these almost opposing viewpoints on one ticket? You know, how do you get – I mean, I, I was kind of scared at first when Paul Ryan got on the ticket because I thought, oh, my God, all the, you know, radical Republicans are going to get all excited. But then when they walked back from his budget – it was like, well, then who are you then? I mean, I just find, I just think that's, you know, they're just, with a muddled sort of mes message of who's on the ticket, it makes it even harder for Republicans to really get excited to get out there and vote. I do believe Except you might have seen, really hate Obama. I thought you might have seen the future uh, at the end of the week last week when you saw Rubio speak and, and Ryan Rubio is, would be terrifying as a, yeah. as a ticket. That's a, that's a lot of energy. And brings a lot to the table. I, I think that'd be scary. Yes. You're talking yes. about a high level of intelligence, mm -hmm. a high level of en energy, but not a lot of political backbone to stand up to the real radical fringe right. And that is what would scare the heck out of me. Mm -hmm. Because... Then you would see the grand old party truly hijacked even more than it has been thus far. <laughs> and uh, I was I was talking with a couple of people um, earlier today about how uh, the old way of doing politics really has died an ignominious death. If you know, in the old days, you would have people like Ted Kennedy on the floor tearing the crap out of the opposition, you know, just lambasting them. But at 5 o'clock, the whistle sounded. Cocktails! <laughs> and by 5.30, <laughs> he was bending elbows with the very same people that he'd been shredding hours before, exactly. and they were working out a real deal yep. on how to compromise. There is no compromise right now. And we're I'm, drinking. I'm not even sure uh, that, too. I'm not even sure that a second term of Barack Obama will inspire a willingness to compromise because then both parties are going to be set. I mean, pretty much the second that he is sworn into his second term, were he elected, is the second that he starts being a lame duck. And the parties will then be pivoting to 2016. And... Hello, we've got some issues to deal with right now. Oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> that stuff will fix itself. Okay. <laughs> On that happy note, <laughs> we will be ending news talk tonight. Uh, here we go. You've been listening to news talk tonight. I'm your host, Dave Moore. I've been joined by Brian Lee and by Jen Just. Jen, thanks for calling in. Appreciate uh, your insight as well as uh, observations. Nice Brian, to also, you. thank you. And also, thank you, Brian. And we'll be back next week. Don't forget, folks, that we've got WTNF. It'll be a special tonight. Uh, our fearless leader for WTNF is still out, but Brian Lee and Paul will be here to carry the torch. So stay tuned. That's all for tonight. I'm Dave Moore. You're listening to On the Horn. See you next week. This is the Hartford Online Radio Network. 21st Century Audio. Delivered. On the Horn .com. One thing that I will note, uh, which is fairly important, particularly to our sponsors, is that we are sponsored by CentralCTDental.com, Deepwater Seafood of Avon, and our friends at Sandus Travel, 
as well as Casa de Hanna and, uh, you know, the folks that actually house this wonderful studio. Thanks for listening. See you next week.